I'm Dr. Tina Cahill, and welcome to Wisdom and Beyond. Today we're going to have a lot of fun. We have with us conductor Joel Spiegelman. Hi, Joel. How are Hi, you? Hi, Tina. Glad to be here. Well, you know, you and I met because you're, you and my husband and a group of other guys have breakfast together every morning yes, in Princeton, New Jersey. Yes, we do. And you call yourself the Romeos. Yes, the Romeos. And when my husband came home and told me he, ha he was having breakfast every mo morning with a group of guys that call themselves the Romeos, I said, oh, barf, get me out of here. But <laughs> Romeos really means... <laughs> Retired old old men eating out. <laughs> okay, I can live with that. That was a little okay. bit better. Okay. So it's a great group. You got it's really a, an example. You meet at Bon Appetit at the Princeton Shopping Center and it's a great example of what we talk about in in psychology sometimes as aging in place where everybody lives wherever they live and you get together and you support each other yes, and we do. you have parties and you visit someone if they're having a problem or if they're sick and what yes. does that mean to you to have that group I every morning? I think it's uh, very invigorating because we have uh, a highly intelligent, yes. erudite people yeah. in that group. That's true. Many of them are quite distinguished yes, okay, I agree. In, their, in their own careers. That's right. And so the sharing, mm -hmm. okay, and the discussions, you know, right. basically trying to solve the problems of the world. That's right. Because that's what we, we discuss often what's current, what that's happened, right. okay? And it's become, it's very stimulating. It and is. I find it, it raises the tone. Yeah. Of and, the the Rome day. and the Romeos are always looking for new members. So um, uh, people should just drop in there at 10 o'clock in the mornings, right? Down at Bon Appetit sometime. Absolutely. Find Check you in. guys. You're kind of in the back there. But that's not what actually we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the fact that you're one of those interesting guys. And you are a conductor. I know nothing about classical music. So, you know, this is. You're going to have to help me here. And you've spent most of your life conducting in Russia. And you moved to Russia in 1965. You were part of the group that sort of brought the avant-garde out in Russia. And you're t you've told me that you're sort of one of the most consistent and long-standing Americans in the cultural world in Russia still today. Exactly. And you recently did this concert, this says Love from Kyrgyzstan. Yes. And you did this big concert over there, uh, which we will be showing here at TV30 and on, on uh, the other mm -hmm. shows through, through which it feeds. And tell me a little bit about how this happened and, and how did this all come about? What's a, a, what's a guy from Princeton, New Jersey, who's with the Romeos every morning, doing, a, doing over in Kyrgyzstan, conducting a big thing with all the ambassadors? Well, it's mm -hmm. just a continuation of my career as an explorer. Okay. I've, okay, I'm also a composer. Mm -hmm. I've had retrospectives in Carnegie Hall, the Kremlin, Moscow Conservatory, and other places. So I function as a performer and a composer. Now... In, on April 7th, there was an uprising in Kyrgyzstan. I remember that. A hundred people were shot to death in the street. It was mm -hmm. a bloodbath. Mm -hmm. um, and a, a young friend of mine, an American, was over there, stuck in a building, couldn't go out, couldn't get food, couldn't get water. They were shooting in the streets. We were trying to figure out every way to how to get him out, and I made my best efforts to let the American embassy, through my own contacts in the State Department, right. know. Okay, one thing led to another, then his mother, who was my partner in Greenland, the writer Galia Morel, decided to go over and visit him. Well, you mean partner in Greenland. Well, I don't have a partner in Greenland. Well, I have an American... <laughs> How do you have, to have a partner a, in Greenland? We, we went together. She's not from Greenland. She's a New Yorker and a Moscovite. Okay. She's a great uh, journalist. Okay. And her specialty was the polar areas of the world, and we've been in Greenland in all of March developing a program called On the Northwest Coast of, of Greenland, near the North Pole, uh, about... Uh, 600 kilometers above the Arctic Circle. Okay, so you're oh. developing a musical program We're in We're developing Greenland. a music. It's continuing. She's okay. going back shortly. Okay. With the, so with you got a hold of your friend in well, Greenland. Well, she, she, well no, she's, she's actually she was Russian. A, no, no, she, she was, was in, in Moscow. Or oh, so, she was in Moscow. Uh, okay. She flew to Kyrgyzstan to visit her son. Okay. And then I talked to her mother very often. Okay, Her mother is 85, very, very smart lady, an economist in international economics. She says to me, you should go. You should go and give to them Kyrgyzstan. a concert. Yeah. I said, I should go. Now so the shooting had stopped by now. Well, it's kind of calmed down, down right? slowed down. I should go and do a requiem concert for the people who have fallen. Oh, that's nice. So I said, all right. So I talked to, uh, on Facebook. I had a friend, pianist, great pianist, Azamat Sadikov, who uh, was part of this pro concert program. I, disc I went over it with him. He said, let me call them. He called the uh, Philharmonic and, um, and an impresario there. He said, it's a great idea. Uh, we'll supply the hall and the orchestra. Can you get the American Embassy involved? I said, I don't know. So make a long story short, through my own contacts at State Department, 
Uh, I, My own contacts at State Department. Was it like High Hillary? Uh, it wasn't High Hillary. It was an <laughs> ambassador. No, it, it was close. <laughs> close enough. Uh, I of an old I'm, friend, I'm an amba former ambassador who just retired from the state. And he liked the idea. And I said, but I don't know the ambassador. He said, he should have worked for me for two years in Moscow. He said, send me a letter. I'll get it to her right away. This was in the morning. Mm -hmm. This was in the morning. By 8 o'clock that evening, he gets back to me. But she said that she read your letter. So I got it to her pretty fast. They'll do anything that you want to support your efforts, cultural Isn't that efforts, nice? within one day. It was like a miracle That's cutting through great. that bureaucracy. That's great. Because, you. you know, we have an air base there at, oh, I, in Bishkek yes, called yes, Manas. Yes. Manas is, I think, the principal air base that feeds fuel refueling for Afghanistan. Okay. It's very important for us. Oh, yes. Okay, we needed to put on a good face. Based. Mm -hmm. to the Kyrgyz people. Sure. So uh, the, uh, the opposition had come into power then. Right. A very famous politician, old timer, Rosa Atambuyeva, who uh, uh, she served in the United Nations for the Soviet Union, things of this sort. So we uh, put on that face. They said yes. Within two days the embassy contacted me, we worked out the detail, and I flew uh, in early June, June 6th, it's a 24-hour flight through sure. Turkey right. to Kyrgyzstan. Right. I picked out the program and I composed a uh, a, uh, a work based on an inspiration uh, from a very famous uh, Kyrgyz author who was famous for his writings in Russian. He's published more than 40 million copies around the world. What's in his name? His name is uh, Chengiz Aitmatov. Very famous. He died two years ago. Mm -hmm. But his name is above all politics in uh, all of the former Soviet Union okay. and many countries throughout the world. Okay. Uh, so basically I was embraced by that family, his widow and oh, his, nice. his daughter Shireen is now entered the political realm. She also s studied at Sarah Lawrence College where I used to teach and ha to make matters even tighter, she was a student of my daughter Katya Leaf who teaches creative writing oh, at the new school. Isn't so that funny? That's, you know, pretty funny. interesting. Yeah. Anyhow, I went, I wrote the work, sent them the music over the internet. The, wow. I copied it out. I, I had two weeks to do this job. Okay, wow. It's a short work, a basically a memorial mm -hmm. work called, uh, it's called the um, Cry of the migra Migratory of Bird or something like mm -hmm. that. The translation is a little difficult. But it's, um, uh, and we did, I did the second movement of the Beethoven Third Symphony, the Funeral March. My work, Tchaikovsky March uh, uh, Slav, which is also a funeral march of a kind. Uh, and so who attended this concert? Oh, it was full. The people, the it pe was given it free, okay? Oh, that's uh, great. Uh, you know, nobody, the orchestra paid, played free of charge. I conducted free of charge. That's great. You know, they covered my expenses, but, you know, right. trip right. and hotel and stuff like that. And so but this was, you were to some extent... A gift from the, was, the U.S. State Department. I was a gift. Mm -hmm. And that I see on the internet, it started a whole series of concerts. Isn't and that peace great? Concerts. I've been looking. They, they picked up on this. That's because great. that's the way, through culture, through a mm -hmm. language that is universal, music mm -hmm. in particular, mm -hmm. that everybody understands. You don't need Well, music is really a mood, sh you know, changes our mood. Well, it's, it was we uplifting. Uh, sure, after uh, all I, this, this th horrible news. The horrible newspaper, event. I got the newspaper reviews, okay, and it said Maestro Spiegelman has inspired everyone through his music. Isn't that great? And I, I you know, that affected that's me. Nice. That was great. Yeah. Yes. So that's wonderful. Good for you. So that's what happened. Good for all you. All of a sudden, like a miracle. Isn't that Miracles great? Miracles happen. But you have been conducting uh, throughout Russia and the whole Soviet bloc I, yes. since the 60s, right? I, I th no, and uh, I'll tell you how it worked. I started conducting, I started performing in Russia in 65 as a harpsichord soloist. Okay. That was also new for them. Okay. And uh, back when you played the harpsichord, this was yeah. one of That's your... That's an early recording done in 1973, my recording of the Goldberg Variations of Bach. Bach. It's okay. a famous, famous work. One of and is this available still? Uh, it's um, not available. That's a private recording. Okay. I will probably yes, it's available uh, in Europe uh, on uh, Azura Recordings. They, okay. they, they distribute it, but okay. it's not distributed here. Okay, uh, okay. Well, go ahead. So you started performing I started performing as a performing Russia, as a, as a harpsichordist and uh, with my own compositions. Okay. okay. Uh, so, as I mentioned, I had several retrospectives in Russia. 
Uh, the first one was in 1999 in honor of my 35th year of cultural work in Russia at the Moscow Conservatory. The last one was on my birthday in 2002 in the Kremlin. And that it was, was a, a special retrospective. It was on my birthday. It was sponsored by the Russian Ministry of Culture yes. and the Russian uh, Cultural Foundation that was set up by Raisa Gorbachev and uh, Nikita Mikhalkov, a famous music movie director who won an Oscar for Burnt by the Sun. And you were asked to do this concert in memory of Raisa. No, no. This is before she passed away. No, no, no. This concert, the concert I did in memory for Raisa was done after this. Okay. This was a gift to okay. me. Okay. I, I got a phone call. You're gi okay. We're giving you a concert in the Kremlin. Right. They have the, uh, the musicians already. You just be there and give a little talk. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Buffalo, New York. So how did a little boy from Buffalo, New York <laughs> end up doing the, um, the you know, concert in memory of Raisa Gorbachev and <laughs> be able to call up the State Department and say we need to do something uh, for all the things that are going on? I mean, how did this happen? Did you, how did you first get involved in music? I got involved in music. Well, no wonder you like Russia. It's really cold in Buffalo, and there's lots of snow. Well, <laughs> Buffalo was, you know, <laughs> Buffalo was, you remember Al Cap's uh, <laughs> Lower Slavovia? <laughs> okay. Something like that. So I, I grew up uh, shoveling snow, clearing ice, and, uh, you know. And what led you to music and well, when? Well, uh, what really brought me in, I, I started playing piano early and didn't take it too seriously until I was 10 years old and heard a recording at my aunt's of Vladimir Horowitz in Toscanini. Oh, wow. I was 10 years old, playing the Tchaikovsky first piano concerto. I said, I have to do that, too. Oh, that's exciting. So I said to my mother, I'm going back to the piano. Well, I went back to the piano, and by 13, I made my first performance that got national attention in Musical America with a great review. That's Six great. months later, I performed as soloist with the Liszt uh, Hungarian Fantasy with the Buffalo Philharmonic, and have been performing, you know, for big audiences since Ever I'm a since kid. Then. So, were you an only no. child? No, I have a sister. Is she older or younger? She's uh, about seven and a half years younger. She's a very fine artist, painter who lives were in your, Washington. Were your uh, parents into the arts? My mother was a good pianist. Okay. My father was a physician, okay. and uh, um, uh, my mother understood completely. She was quite talented and quite good. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I went at, at this thing, the piano, like a lion. I used to practice mm -hmm. six to eight hours a day when, as a child. Wow, any parent's dream. I, I don't <laughs> know if it was a dream or not. I used to battle I, my it, kids it to get them to practice. It was a dream or a nightmare. I night. lost. It's somewhere between a dream and a nightmare. It depends <laughs> how you look at it. Okay, so. <laughs> so. Well, you know what Malcolm Gladwell said in one of his books, I forget the latest one, what it was called, that we can be, you know, if you yeah. want to be an expert yeah. at something, you need about 10,000 hours of practice. Yeah. Well, and you, know, action, you, you know the old story. A child of three can do it with 30 years of practice. Right, right, right. But uh, in any case, um, uh, I was always interested in Russia through my parents are born in Russia. Okay, your parents my gra born there. grandparents spoke Russian. Okay. My first Russian words I learned from my grandparents. Mm -hmm. And I had always a desire to learn that language and mm -hmm. to understand that culture. Every year, my mother took me to the, hear the, all of the great Russian concerts. Oh, that's pianists great. like Horowitz, Heifetz, Elman, Milstein, Pietigorsky, who were then playing. Oh, Every year great. I heard them once or twice. They, Buffalo was on the concert route. Really? Yeah. Wow. So they'd come through. And was through. there a Russian settlement there? No. Or were you the only no, no, Russians around? No, there were around? Jewish settlements. Okay. okay. And so many not of the necessarily Russian Jews. Basically Jews. came from Russia and Poland. But my mm -hmm. family is from the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Okay. I visited my father's hometown. Isn't that great? I still had relatives. This it's was great. in 67. With all my children, it's I went great. there. I went camping in Russia in 1967. And it must have been so wonderful for your parents to be able to see you attached to you the know, culture like, in which they grew up? Uh, unfortunately, my mother passed away before that. My father all knew about it. He was always afraid I'm going to Russia, something oh. is going to happen. But yeah. uh, my regret, a strange regret, is that I could not, when I, when I, once I mastered the language and I speak Russian right. well, would love to have a conversation with my grandfather. Absolutely. Yeah. But that can't happen. Yeah. Only in another world, yeah. <laughs> in another space. You know, I have a friend from Russia whose child grew up here in right. the United States, and he told me one of the sad moments of his life was when his son hurt himself. Instead of saying oi, like you would say in Russia, he said ouch.
Right. And he said, I knew then that my son was an American. Right. And I, you know, yeah. and there was this little split between yeah. the two of them. Well, oi, the two, oi has, is a multifaceted word. Yes, it is a multifaceted <laughs> word. I agree right. with that. Yes. So, 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 so your, your parents, your father certainly got to see you. Yeah. What happened was I was uh, teaching and at, I always had this desire, subconscious and conscious, to visit Russia. Even way back in the, in the mid-50s, I wrote to Shostakovich, asked him if I could become his student. That's great. And he wrote me back and said, unfortunately, I'm, you know, I can't. Well, right. of course, he couldn't in those days. Yeah. Stalin had died a year or two before that. Right. I was just a graduate student right. in, in Russia, so I went to France instead. Okay. And so I lived in France for four years and studied with the greatest And French when teacher. did you start composing? I was 12 years old when I started composing. So tell me about composing. I always think about this. How is it? that how do you what happens in your brain do you hear the music do you see the notes what happens that's a very good good question because you're talking about creative process all mm -hmm. right and how does creative process happen in writing a work of music okay first of all we we talk about inspiration okay mm -hmm. but how do you how does inspiration take place. Right. How do you have the cognitive oh, I, awareness? I will tell you. Okay. Because I, you know, I've thought about this. Right. All I need are two or three notes, any notes, and I'll plunk them down or write them down. And they generate a whole series of musical thoughts. So musical thoughts. So, so how does it, how do you experience it? Uh, Do you experience it that you know the notes, like you know middle C or well, whatever, and you experience the notes, or do you, he how do you experience the sound of that? I hear the sound. You hear the sound. I, first of all, okay. I hear the sound, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't need to, an instrument, to, the, for I studied, mm -hmm. uh, 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 for conducting, I have to study a score, Tchaikovsky Fifth Symphony, I had to conduct in mm -hmm. Mexico on a, on a, uh, on a uh, moment's notice. Okay, I read it, read it from the score because I can read a score like you read okay. a book. Okay, but right. in composing, composing is the art of discovery. Lately, I've been going back to the piano with great enthusiasm to work up my old repertory. And I've been going into Schubert and Chopin and Beethoven and Brahms. And especially, I see, my God, what incredible genius there mm -hmm. is here. What incredible inspiration. Okay, so it's... You know, there is a relationship between music and mathematics, and music works, let's say, as a, I would call it a horizontal and vertical axis. Okay. Okay. In other words, melody mm -hmm. or melodic configurations mm -hmm. and the movement of harmony. So do you think that this creative talent that you have was there from the beginning, and yes. you dr and you went forward with it. So you felt the drive. I to felt go the drive. Since you think I was you a felt kid. the drive to go forward with it because you knew you were good at it? Because you know we all succeed no. pretty much with our strengths, right? Yeah. We all like to do what we're good at because that's fun. We like to succeed. I mean, was it that, or 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 how can you even remember what yeah. drove you? Yeah, it was an impulse. Okay. Okay. It was an impulse to to get it down, okay? Right. I, I, was ha I was listening to music. I don't remember, it was, I think, a work called The Night on Bald Mountain of, of, of uh, Mussorgsky. I said, wow, that's really mystical. That's, I was 12 mm -hmm. years old. Mm -hmm. so I went out and bought music paper and started writing. Interesting. And then when I was 16, and I've been writing little things. I went to Interlochen Music uh, Camp. Right. My grandson is now studying filmmaking there. Oh, that's so great. And uh, he, I, I wrote my first string quartet there. Interesting. Not very good, but I, you know, I, yeah. I, I wrote it and some piano music. Yeah. So you really sort of started so, writing music because you could not not do yeah, it. Yeah, but I remember the criticism of my teacher there it was a professor at one of the Midwestern universities. He said, you think that every note you write is like manna from heaven. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that's what we <laughs> like, all think when we're yeah, creating we're, we're, something. <laughs> yeah, I said, wow. I did. But no, that's why God made no, editors, basically you know. Basically, <laughs> it's correction, self-correction, it's revision, it's, it, it's constant, constantly that. Uh, uh, it's to me the great uh, exaltation of moving into that space is dis is discovery. And when you've mm -hmm. discovered it, mm -hmm. like you, a scientist will make a mm -hmm. discovery in physics mm -hmm. or a mathematical formula, mm -hmm. you know you've discovered it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that that this this feeling that you're talking about is 
probably there across the arts. I mean, I know that when I speak at big conventions, which isn't singing and it isn't music or it isn't any of that kind of stuff, but you know when sort of the room is one and everyone's laughing and the energy is high. Right. And that feels so fun. Exactly. It just feels so right, uh, and that's what you're saying. What you it just feels so right. It feels also in performing, okay, making yeah. contact with your audience. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, that's a good question. What's the difference between conducting and writing? I mean, or, or those performing. are two different skill sets. They're diff uh, conducting and performing, performing across the board, the harpsichord, or whatever. Or the piano. Is right. They're all different they're skill different sets, uh -huh. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I have been blessed, thank you know, the Lord, that I have the, the three of those things, okay? But the, the, the mindset when you get into conducting is very different than, let's say, performing oh, or piano Oh, I would work. think so. So when so you're performing, different. It's about you, and it's about connecting it's through your music to the audience. Right. Okay. You're on. Yeah. Uh, you're performing. You're on autopilot. You've got right. it in your memory, right. the muscle memory, right. the memory of, in the right. mind, and you're interpreting. Right. Uh, now, what happens when you're conducting? When you're conducting, What's the it's difference? also you're, you're, you're basically conducting. You are also interpreting through your body gestures. Okay, because there are a lot of functions that have to, you have to keep right. going. You have to keep 100 guys or men and you women. You have to take care of your orchestra. You have when to you're take conducting. care of your orchestra, and so they have to know that you're ahead of them, that you know the score. Right, and so I'm thinking that when you entertain through your music, you touch the audience, but your job as a conductor yeah. is to take care of your orchestra, and through the music that comes from them, is the connection with the audience, it's but the also through with, your body language. Th but it's the connection with the orchestra and with its and and through the audience. It's emotional. Uh -huh. It's intellectual. It's uh -huh. intellectual. Do you feel different that when you're conduct? Let me ask this question: Do you feel a different kind of connection when you're conducting as opposed to when you're performing? Yes. What's that difference? That's a good question because the, when I'm performing, I mean I'm molding clay. I'm making it. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm making I'm making the music. I can change it. I'm I'm my own master at that ca mm -hmm. case. When I'm conducting, I have to communicate to a hundred people or so. Mm -hmm. Okay, my will, my wishes, and my intentions. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's why we rehearse. Mm -hmm. Okay, and rehearse quite quietly. Okay, and rehearse and work out all of the mm -hmm. you know bumps sure. and stuff like yeah. that. That that's why we work very mm -hmm. hard at it. Um, sometimes we don't have a chance. I've been a guest conductor, like I said. Uh -huh. I did Tchaikovsky Fifth in Mexico. I had one rehearsal. Yeah. The orchestra in Mexico was basically a Russian orchestra, a lot yeah. of Russian immigrants. So I said, what language are we going to rehearse? He said, you can talk Russian to us. But they all knew that music. Sure. So my, I knew the music. So boom, we went in right. one rehearsal. It was, right. it, it was fantastic. Right. Have you seen the, by the way, have you seen the movie The Concert? Yeah, I ha yeah, it's a. I love that movie. Yeah, that I was a great. I movie. just want to tell you about connecting to the audience. Like, have a few uh -huh. minutes. Uh, yeah, I performed a harpsichord concert. It was in 1962 in Moscow, 65 and 66. I was playing early music from the 16th century through Scarlatti. Okay, I was playing the A minor English suite of Bach. A minor, which means A, the note A mm -hmm. is very key. Mm -hmm. The harpsichord works on the basis of plucking strings with plectra. Mm -hmm. The A's on my instrument started to disappear. Oh they were gosh. breaking. The quills were breaking. And I said, I'm in the middle of a concert. There are 600 people out right. there. What am I going to do? I'll tell you what I did. I came. I made a close. I looked at the audience. I went like this. <laughs> I wa walked off stage. And like a doctor, I came out with my little black bag. <laughs> I took off my tail suit, okay, the jacket. Mm -hmm. I opened the instrument, completely opened it, and repaired it oh, wow. in front of them. Either was that, that was the right. choice. The mm -hmm. Well, that was an authentic connection. There was, you weren't trying that to made, fake it. Yeah. You couldn't fake it. it yeah. was, I had to repair yeah. it. Oh, so yeah. I repaired it. It's great. I, I like authentic connections. I, 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 I repaired it. I tuned it a little bit because it gets out of tune in 10 seconds. Fixed it, put back my j jacket, and continued the concert. They Isn't had a lot great? of fun. I bet they had great fun. But that, because that, they you sort can't of plan got that moment. No. That's and a I moment. bet they probably really loved it because they got to see you as a human being, not just the conductor. Well, a uh, problem to solve. You well, solved a, a problem. Problem to solve. Yeah, that's things, great. Things happen in conducting, too. Believe yeah, me, I conducted sure. an opera, The Queen of Spades. So which, do you, which so, would you rather do, conduct or perform? I like, you know, I, I, I like conducting. But I, I'm rediscovering myself 
as a performer with enormous Good. enthusiasm. Good. And I'm, you know, and I, I had to test myself. Is 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 my technique still there? Is my old repertoire? Yes, it's there. That's great. Uh, how that miracle is happening, I don't know. Yeah. And so, where are you going to take that? Where are you going to take don't that know performance yet. part? Well, first of all, let's say I work up one of my programs right. of classics. Right. I probably would play it for a few friends. Mm -hmm. You begin to test right. yourself. That's right. Play it for a few friends right. before you venture out any other place. Right. I've done this before, okay, to mm -hmm. see if you're still there, it's right. still there. Uh, is the mechanism working? Sure. Is the brain feeding the <laughs> feeding you right. the notes, et cetera, et cetera? Right. And then we'll see. You know, I, I don't great. know where it'll go, but it's. Uh, um, I, I like it, and I'll tell you why I love it. Because since I've been spending the last 20 years or so or more as a conductor, principally, mm -hmm. uh, I look at the music I play very differently now. Oh, that's interesting. I in look what at way? it as an, an interpreter, as a conductor. Okay. Okay. I look at the colors. If I take a Beethoven sonata, uh -huh. of the little notes, little gestures, mm -hmm. very differently. Like I'm conducting an orchestra, and it's all changing. So you f do you think that conducting has changed your performance? Yes. Interesting. No question it? about it. it. And it's freed it up a lot. It's freed it up. Absolutely. Oh, that's great. N that's great. absolutely. I mean, it's. Um, I'll see what happens, you know. This That's is fascinating. A, I'm sure there are a zillion venues where you could try this out. Well, let me get it up first, and then yeah. we'll look about a venue. That's great. <laughs> well, you're really great. It's so much fun to have you here. Thank you. And this um, CD is going to play on uh, Princeton Community TV in Love from Kyrgyzstan. And I think the American ambassador is here, right, at this concert. Is that right? She was there. She spoke. Okay. You know, on this CD, in the original, there are a number of Russian speeches. I don't know if okay. they'll be included because there's no subtitling. Okay. She spoke. Uh, I spoke. Uh, I, I, I read a statement from John Corigliano, who's mm -hmm. basically our most famous composer. Okay. John sent me something to read, uh, uh, to, and I did read that statement. I gave a statement. The daughter of the great writer, Chinggis Aitmatov, gave a beautiful speech, and one of their... Uh, uh, now, younger politicians, Adil Baisalov, uh, gave a lo wonderful speech. People thanked me, and at the end, um, I think it was either one of the ministers presented me with this incredible coat that That's is so only nice. given to the honored guest of the country. <laughs> Isn't that great? And <laughs> doesn't it feel great to know that besides your love of music and, and doing all of this because you love, you know, you love music and you want to share it, that it had hopefully an impact to all the people there to let them know that they're cared about and what had happened was so horrible and to sort of honor that memory and inspire people to make maybe to go forward. Well also they're cared about. It, it gives hope. That's right. And also we wanted to show that America That's right. cares. That's right. Isn't that great? It through Right. Inspiration right. through culture, right, and, and that was important. Absolutely. I think it was something. In this is a Muslim country, basically, mm -hmm. okay, right. a moderate Muslim country, right. hi, with highly educated right. people right. and erudite people. I was, I, I, right. I appreciate. I'd like to return many times there. It's great. Well, you know, my line is: the wider our webs of connectedness, the higher we bounce. Good so idea. thank you for making some more connections between the U.S. and in this particular situation, Kyrgyzstan, and how fascinating, and you're going to have to let us know now when you're ready to perform. I need to know that, okay, I'll let you when know. you're ready to do it. Okay. So thank you so much, and it's wonderful what you bring to the Romeos. I know they value you so much, and those of us that have loved ones there, it's just great fun to get to know you. Thank you very so much. So take care of yourself to each of you who've been here today. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure you know much more about the music that Joel is talking about than I do. So run out there and have a great time. Listen to the music you love and look for Joel Spiegelman when we do this concert here at TV30. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>